Reflow offers two completely different fluid simulation technologies. The first one is called SPH. This is a fully particle-based approach and perfectly suited for small or mid-scale projects where a high level of detail is required. The SPH emitters can be found here. The other technology is also known as Hybrido and uses a combination of grid cells and particles. This method allows you to simulate large bodies of fluids, for example, huge floods, rocky coasts with breaking waves, and open oceans. Hybrido fluids are able to create secondary effects, such as splashes and foam. SPH fluids, on the other hand, cannot produce secondary elements by default. This is only possible with scripting or reflow's graph system. All Hybrido nodes are grouped here. When we talk about grid fluids, we have to explain a few basic things first. The space where the simulation takes place is called the domain. The domain itself is subdivided into small elements, the cells. Inside these cells, there are particles, representing the fluid's volume. The particles are not only used to visualize the fluid, but they are also required for mesh creation and they carry the fluid's velocity. Please note, the number of particles per cell can be adjusted. The fluid itself consists of the core fluid and the surface. The surface is very important because it is a place where everything happens. The interaction with objects, the creation of splashes and foam, and the application of the displacement. The latter is a substructure used to add small waves. In order to set up a basic hybrid scene, a few elements are required. The first node is a domain. In contrast to previous reflow versions, the domain is no longer a box with a fixed space, but dynamically adapted to the fluid's volume. Therefore, it can be positioned freely inside your scene. The next element is an emission object. This is a place where the fluid particles will be created. This object can be of any shape and located anywhere inside the scene. It is not bounded to a certain area or the domain's viewport icon. When you add an emitter, you might be asked which emission object you want to use. If there is only a single object in your scene, then it will be attached automatically. The emitter only defines a particle's initial speed and emission direction, not where the particles are created. As mentioned, this is done with the emission object. The direction is indicated by an arrow and can be changed easily by rotating the emitter. Finally, a force is required to accelerate the fluid. A commonly used demon is gravity, but any other force-based demon works as well. When you simulate now, you can observe how the fluid is released from the emission object and accelerated by the gravity demon. In many cases, it is necessary to enclose the fluid with a container. The cube top open node is perfectly suited for this purpose. Of course, both the emission and container objects can be resized according to your needs. This small set of nodes is already enough to create the first splash. Now, it is time to hit simulate and get some results. After a few moments, you can already see a turbulent fluid with nice splashes, but also some obviously unwanted effects. The fluid needs by far more particles to look good, and there is, more or less, a large gap. This gap is a result of a process called voxelization where the scene elements are translated into cells. If the cells of the fluid and the object do not match, then you will see these gaps. One method that helps to address both problems is to decrease cell size. In Reflow, domains and objects have separate settings for cell size, but there is one more thing to consider. An object's cell size should not be smaller than the associated domain's parameter, because the domain's value is higher ranking. This means, that when the object's cell size is smaller than the domain's value, you will not see any improvement. Changing the cell sizes for hundreds of objects can be a very tedious task, and for this reason, we've added a nice little tool. Click on the Scale Options icon and look for Cell Size Scale. If you change this value, the cell sizes of all domains and nodes will be affected. With 0.5, for example, the global size will be 0.15 instead of the default value of 0.3.
and this is a formula. Now, the simulation looks much better, but it is also completely different from the previous pass, because the number of cells influences the fluid's behavior. Despite of our efforts, there is still a small buffer between the particles and the container's surface. To get rid of this gap, you have several options. The first idea is to further decrease cell size, but this would allocate too many resources, especially when your setup is very large. Another approach is to reposition the container and shift it closer to the fluid. For a scene like that, this might be a solution, but definitely not for production shots. A third way uses the object's volume features. Under the volume mode parameter, you can find these entries. Solid inside, solid outside, and shell. With solid inside, the object acts like a completely filled body. Solid outside means that the object is hollow and everything around it is considered solid. Shell creates a thin double walled object, for example a balloon. To avoid leaking, the shell mod always adds an offset to the surface. The fluid will never touch the shell directly. This is exactly what you have seen so far. Select Solid Outside and go to the Display Volume panel. When you activate the visual representation of the object's volume, you can see a plane with a gradient. This is the object's signed distance field. A particle which enters the field can be considered inside or outside the object easily. The area where the collision finally happens is determined by the red band around the object's surface. The collision can be improved by modifying the distance field with the Surface Offset parameter under Volume. Surface Offset accepts positive and negative values. When you enter a new value, the field changes. Please also bear in mind that this parameter depends on the current cell size. It is not possible to use any random number. After the adjustment of the distance field, the collision has been greatly improved, as you can see here. The result of the previous simulation already shows many details, nice splashes and lots of turbulence but it is still lacking particles. As mentioned before, the number of particles per cell can be user-defined. The appropriate parameters can be found in the emitter's emitter settings. The number of particles per cell can be adjusted separately for the surface and the core fluid. The values you enter are raised to the power of 3. So a value of 2 creates 8 particles per cell, and with 4, there are 64 particles. With surface bandwidth, you can define the surface's thickness. All particles below the surface are considered core fluid particles. When the stream option is active, reflow creates a constant stream of particles with the adjusted initial speed. As you can see, speed can also be zero, and in this case, the fluid's velocity is a result of the accelerating gravity. With different combinations of chittering and seed, you are able to avoid a uniform look of the fluid because the particles are slightly displaced when they leave the emitter. With more particles, the result looks like a fluid now, but what about simulation times? Are there any methods to accelerate this process? Absolutely. The easiest way is to use Reflow's command line version, or deactivate the viewport with the Alt-D shortcut. In Reflow 2013, the command line can be triggered easily by activating the appropriate simulation option. Another, very effective method is to change the domain simulation mode from adaptive to dense. This method requires more memory and is mainly used for GPU based simulations, but if you have enough RAM, then it is a very effective method to speed up things. Finally, there is the OpenCL option for GPU based simulations. Open the 
Simulation Options Hybrid or Panel and activate Use OpenGL GPU. The benefit you can get from an OpenCL simulation strongly depends on the used graphic board and the scene's characteristics. Generally, simulations with large amounts of particles perform better. Above, you can also see some hybrid options to control the server's accuracy. For most simulations, the standard values work well. If you need higher accuracy, for example with fast-moving fluids or objects, then you should consider increasing max substeps. Please bear in mind that this action will also change the fluid's behavior. Since the fluid is not moving very fast here, a maximum substep of 1 should be enough. If you want to know more about substeps and timescales, please take a look at our simulation options video tutorial. Now, kick off another simulation and you will see that Hybrido performs much better with the new settings. In the last chapter of this overview, we want to give you a few basic tips for how to animate emitters effectively. Animated emitters are required for rivers, streams or all kinds of floods, but it isn't always easy to create enough turbulence. A quick and very effective method is to change the emission direction randomly. This can be achieved by setting a few random keys, but there is a much better solution – expressions. Expressions are based on formulas and functions and they can be applied to any animatable parameter. Here, it will control the rotation of an emitter. In order to achieve an up and down motion along the x-axis, an animation curve is required. Right-click on the Rotation X value and choose Open Curve. The Curve Editor appears. Let's say the emitter should oscillate randomly between 70 and 110 degrees. For this task, we will take a sine curve, because it is perfectly suited with its valleys and peaks. The oscillation is 20 degrees in each direction from 90 degrees. So the expression is now The motion looks good, but the frequency is not high enough and we need more up and down cycles. Multiply the time value with a factor, for example 20. Finally, a random function is added. With this short term, we have randomized the node's emission direction, and this is a result. Of course, a similar expression can be added to the emitter speed value as well. Something like that. A noise field daemon around the emission object can also help to achieve more randomness.